one objects. I don't see anyone on the floor. If we could go in that order, uh, I think everyone could be accommodated before the vote at 6 o'clock. Is that okay with everyone? Thank you. Um, Mr. President. The Senator from Oregon. Thank you, Mr. President. I, I rise to, to address the McConnell Inhofe Amendment to repeal EPA's authority to regulate greenhouse gases. My colleague from Texas was just addressing this amendment and, and noting her support for it. But I'd like to bring to my colleagues' attention several reasons that this amendment is bad policy for America. First and foremost, this amendment increases our addiction to foreign oil. It increases oil consumption by 455 million barrels. Now, right now, we import about 9.7 million barrels of oil per day. And so this amendment is equivalent to six weeks' worth of oil imports. Now, recognize that gas prices are about $3.5 a gallon. So the McConnell Inhofe Amendment amounts to a $68 billion price tag for working families to buy gas, to buy gas from oil imported from overseas. And this isn't a tax that in any way supports our economy. In fact, this is a tax that goes out of our economy to purchase energy from overseas. So from the Middle East, from Nigeria, from Venezuela. That's very profitable to the companies that supply that oil. It's very profitable to the governments far outside of the United States of America but it certainly hurts the citizens of our nation. It takes our energy dollars and puts them elsewhere rather than keeping them inside our economy. It decreases our national security rather than increasing our national security. Furthermore, gasoline prices are set by the law of supply and demand. This amendment increases our demand for foreign oil. So if anything, this amendment increases gas prices. Now, my colleague from Texas just said, we cannot afford to, quote, raise the cost of fuel. I absolutely agree. And that is why we should defeat this amendment. Indeed, I think almost everyone understands that when you increase demand for a product, you drive the price up, not down. But there are some third parties that have weighed in on this conversation. PolitiFact.com did an analysis of the claim that this amendment would keep prices from increasing and it did not find this claim to be true. It found it to be false. So at this moment, when world events are unfolding in Cairo, in Egypt, in Libya, and we recognize that our dependence on foreign oil is a huge strategic vulnerability for the United States of America, that the flow of our energy dollars overseas is a huge mistake for our economy, why, why would we vote for an amendment designed to increase our dependence our dependence on oil, our dependence on foreign governments, to decrease our security and to damage our economy. It is simply a wrong amendment in all that framework about our dependence on foreign oil. Second, this amendment is attack on public health. It's an unprecedented attack, asking Congress to step in and veto the scientific judgment of the EPA scientists. It tells the agency charged with protecting our public health and the health of our children to ignore dangerous global warming gas pollution, carbon pollution, and a long list of other global warming gases. You know, the Clean Air Act in 1990 alone prevented 205,000 premature deaths, 674,000 cases of chronic bronchitis, 22,000 cases of heart disease, 850,000 asthma attacks, and 18 million cases of child respiratory illness. In 2010, the Clean Air Act prevented 1.7 million asthma attacks, 130,000 heart attacks, 86,000 emergency room visits. It's been studied time and time again. And what we know is the application of the effort to clean up our air results in all of us having a better quality of life. This amendment, this attack on public health, is the wrong policy for our nation. 
You know, it's, uh, again, something that third parties have, have weighed in on. Those who, who seek to protect our health and our health care system. The American Lung Association calls this amendment, and I quote, a reckless and irresponsible attempt to put special interests ahead of public health. The American Public Health Association has weighed in similarly. Finally, this amendment is an attack on science. The Clean Air Act, passed by a large bipartisan majority and signed by President George H.W. Bush, tasked the EPA with updating our clean air standards and setting common sense limits on pollution based on recent science. This amendment would, give Congress, would have Congress step in and overrule EPA on science, not just by gutting basic protections for clean air and clean water, but by repealing EPA's program for having polluters simply report their pollution. In other words, this amendment says to the American public, we're not even going to let you know about the dangerous pollutants being put into the air. And certainly, that philosophy, not only of attacking our public health, but of attacking our right to know, is absolutely wrong. So colleagues, let me just wrap up. This amendment increases our dependence on foreign oil. It increases air pollution that endangers our health. It overrules the nation's top scientific experts who are warning us to reduce pollution, not increase it. It asks American families to pay $68 billion to the oil industry and foreign governments instead of keeping that money here at home. It's a mistake. Let's vote it down. Thank you, Mr. President. Mr. President, the Senator from Kentucky. I ask unanimous consent to set aside the pending amendment and call it my amendment number 199. Is there objection? No pending, but just for discussion. This amendment. Uh, objection is heard. This amendment, uh, number 199, would save the taxpayer $200 billion. Now, recently, you've seen some discussion, but I think the American taxpayers are actually baffled that there's not more discussion up here. We have proposals of a deficit from the other side of $1.65 trillion, and yet we're not down here discussing this. We haven't passed a budget. We haven't passed any appropriation bills this year. The American people wonder what we're doing. You wonder why the American people say Congress has about a 13 percent approval rate? Why aren't we today talking about a budget? Why aren't we talking about appropriations bills? Why do they not come out of committee? And then when we get to the proposals, look at the proposals. In the red we have the deficit, $1.5 trillion, maybe $1.6 trillion. Here we have the proposals. The other side you can't even see without a magnifying glass. Six billion dollars. We borrow four billion dollars in one day. We spend ten billion dollars in one day and the best they can do is six billion for a whole year. Our proposal is a little bit better but still doesn't touch the problem. Sixty-one billion dollars in cuts sounds like a lot of money. Well, you know what? We increased spending by $700 billion, and now we're going to nibble away at $61 billion. But put it in perspective, saving $61 billion on $1.5 trillion means that either a proposal, Republican or Democrat, is going to add trillions of dollars to the deficit. I'm proposing something a little more bold. I'm proposing $200 billion in cuts. I think it's the very least we can do. $200 billion in cuts can be gotten rather easily. The Government Accountability Office said there's $100 billion in waste, duplicate programs. Why don't we cut that? What are we doing? If you look at the charts of what's going on here and you say what's happened to spending, the yellow line around 2008 when we got the current administration is going up exponentially. That's the spending that's going up. The spending is driving the deficit. You look at the two lines over here, you can't even see the difference. This is the Republican proposal to cut $61 billion in proposed increases. Spending still going up. The deficit is going up. We need to do more. The danger is if we do nothing, that we may well face a debt crisis in our country. We need to do more. My amendment will cut $200 billion in spending. And when I go home and I talk to the grassroots voters, they say that's not even enough. We need more. 
But at the very least, let's have a significant cut in spending and do something to get the deficit under control before it's too late. Thank you. President. The Senator from Louisiana. Please let me correct um, myself. Earlier today, I said that Senator Coons was from Delaware, clear, Connecticut. Clearly, he is from Delaware. And Senator Johans is not on the floor, but Senator Barrasso is. It's been a long day, Mr. President, and I apologize to my colleagues. But the Senator from Wyoming is going to speak for a few minutes, and then the Senator from uh, Vermont, Senator Sanders. And I'm still hoping that we can have a vote on one or two amendments at 6 o'clock. Mr. President. The Senator from Wyoming. Thank you, Mr. President. Mr. President, I rise to speak about the uh, McConnell Amendment, in favor of the McConnell Amendment. Mr. President, gas prices have increased 43 cents in the last month and 77 cents a gallon over the last year. These skyrocketing prices are hurting American families and are threatening to derail the economic recovery. You say, how much is this impact on the American family? Well, the Department of Energy says that the average American family will spend about $700 more on gas this year than they did last year. That is going to impact every family every family trying to deal with bills and kids and a mortgage. Um, and it's not like this problem just happened overnight, Mr. President. Mr. President, for over two years, Americans have heard the President deliver speeches and make promises on energy. But the President says one thing and then he does another. And that say one thing, do another policy does nothing to ease the pain at the pump. The administration's policies are making the problems today worse. The President's reckless policies have virtually shut down offshore exploration for oil. Last week, former President Bill Clinton called the delays in offshore oil and gas drilling permits ridiculous. Offshore oil production in the Gulf of Mexico is expected to drop 15 percent this calendar year. What that means is higher gas prices and fewer American jobs. The administration actually told Congress they said that we can replace the loss of American oil from the Gulf of Mexico with more oil from OPEC. That's exactly what this administration told Congress in October. In justifying more restrictive offshore drilling rules, the administration admitted that this would lead to lower production of American oil. The administration wrote, quote, the impact on domestic deepwater hydrocarbon production as a result of these regulations is expected to be negative. And then the administration went on and said, currently there is sufficient spare capacity in OPEC to offset a decrease in Gulf of Mexico deep water production that could occur as a result of their ruling. That is this administration's mindset. Don't worry about domestic production. Forget about domestic production. OPEC has us covered. The administration's shutdown of American oil and gas exploration is not the only problem. The administration is also aggressively implementing Environmental Protection Agency regulations that will drive up the cost of energy. The EPA's climate change regulations under the Clean Air Act will cause gas prices for every American to go up even more. That's why I'm down here today. The McConnell Amendment will fix this problem. Senator Inhofe originally introduced the legislation in the Senate. It was introduced in conjunction with a bill in the House by Representative Fred Upton. This legislation will stop the Environmental Protection Agency's regulatory overreach that is going to increase gas prices. When Congress refused to pass the President's cap-and-trade scheme last year, the administration turned to Plan B. Plan B, the use of the Clean Air Act to regulate climate change. The theory behind it is that additional restrictions on carbon-based energy and higher costs for gasoline are needed to make their green energy more competitive. Now, the key word here is competitive, not actually making green, air, green energy more affordable, just more competitive, not by driving down the cost of green energy, but by driving up the cost of red, white, and blue American energy. Energy Secretary Stephen Chu has even said publicly that Quote, we have to figure out how to boost the price of gasoline to the levels in Europe. Mr. President, the price of your, in Europe, $8 a gallon. Well, under this cover of creating green jobs, EPA regulations are increasing the cost of red, white, and blue energy. 
This administration is trying to achieve its goals, the same goals as cap and tax, by placing a massive energy tax on gasoline and gasoline production. Now, one of the ways that the EPA will use the Clean Air Act is to regulate greenhouse gas emissions from America's oil refineries. We have not had a new oil refinery built in this country since 1976. The EPA's climate regulations will make it even more difficult and more costly to build and operate refineries. The result, of course, is higher gas prices at the pump and a greater reliance on imported gasoline. The Environmental Protection Agency's climate regulations must be stopped. They are arbitrary, they are costly, they are destructive, and they are politically driven. The EPA's climate rules are just one tool to make gasoline prices go up. But this administration is proposing dozens more. I've introduced legislation similar to Senator McConnell's amendment and Senator Inhofe's bill. But Mr. President, my bill is more comprehensive. My bill, S-228, is called the Defending America's Affordable Energy and Jobs Act. It will block the same manipulation of the laws to increase the future cost of gasoline on all Americans. My legislation, which has the support of 20 senators, would block the manipulation and the misuse of the Clean Air Act, the Clean Water Act, the Endangered Species Act, the, environmental, the National Environmental Policy Act, and the use of citizen lawsuits. I am trying to stop this administration from placing a massive energy tax on gasoline and other forms of affordable energy. The Environmental Species Act is currently being used to remove 187,000 square miles of land from energy exploration. A decision of this magnitude will drastically limit oil and gas production, development, and exploration. To do this all in the name of climate change. Mr. President, when the administration blocks production of American oil used to make gasoline, American families pay higher prices at the pump. They pay those higher prices today, and the prices will remain high in the future. I plan to continue to fight the many ways this administration is trying to enact cap and tax policies and raise gas prices. The President says he wants renewable energy to be the cheapest form of energy. He needs to level with the American people. He needs to admit that his scheme is to raise the cost of all other forms of energy and make the American people pay the bill. We should be exploring for more American energy offshore, on federal lands, and in Alaska. I urge my colleagues to support the McConnell Amendment so that we can block the administration's costly regulations and protect the pocketbooks of American families. The President's policies are making the pain at the pump even worse. It is time to stop these policies today with the McConnell Amendment. Thank you, Mr. President. I yield the floor. Mr. President. The Senator from Vermont. Thank you, Mr. President. Mr. President, I think we all know that elections have consequence, consequences. Uh, I doubt seriously, however, that when most voters went to the polls last November, that they were voting for more of their kids to get aggravated asthma or more people to go to the hospital with respiratory problems or more people to get sick and in general. I do not think the people went to the polls this past November to vote to put big oil and big polluters in charge. I didn't see those TV ads on television. But make no mistake, people may not have voted for a polluter poison agenda, but that is exactly what they are getting from the Republicans in the House and their colleagues here in the Senate. Their agenda is to deregulate polluters, even if it harms our national security. They want to gut the bipartisan Clean Air Act, even if doing that harms public health. Republicans claim that the Inhofe Amendment would lower gas prices. That claim was found to be false by PolitiFact.com. Meanwhile, the Clean Air Act is actually raising fuel economy standards and is projected to save drivers $2,800 on gas for new vehicles. And the reason for that is pretty obvious. We are making an effort 
to see that cars manufactured and sold in this country get decent mileage per gallon. We wonder why all over the world people are driving cars that get 40, 50, 60 miles per gallon, and we're stuck with cars that get 15 or 20 miles per gallon. We can do, we must do, and we are doing better in that area, and we've got to continue to go forward. The Clean Air Act standards are projected to save 2.3 billion barrels of oil. When you get cars that are energy efficient, when you get hybrids, when you get electric cars, you are not consuming oil from Saudi Arabia. We all talk right here in the Senate about the need to move this country toward energy independence, but the Clean Air Act is actually helping to deliver it. That is good news for our national security, but not for polluters, and Senator Inhofe's amendment would keep us dependent on foreign oil, something we certainly do not want to be the case. <coughs> My Republican friends claim that the Clean Air Act regulations are destroying the economy. That claim is also false. This chart here shows that even as we have reduced pollution in the air by 63% since 1970, our economy grew by 210% and added nearly 60 million jobs. In fact, the Clean Air Act and other environmental laws have helped create hundreds of thousands of jobs in environmental technologies and pollution control industries. In my view, if we invest properly in energy efficiency and in such sustainable energies as wind, solar, geothermal, biomass, over a period of years, we will, in fact, not only clean up our environment, not only move us toward energy independence, but create millions of good-paying jobs. For every dollar invested in clean air, we see up to $40 in return in economic and health benefits to America. We should all understand, however, that while big polluters may not like the Clean Air Act, it benefits every American. Why is it that after we have made significant progress in beginning to clean up our air, there are people who want to bring us back to the days when polluters could just fill the air with all kinds of soot and other very harmful products which are causing disease all over America. Thanks to the Clean Air Act, we are actually saving 160,000 lives each year. People are not dying from premature deaths as they would have if the air that they were breathing was dirty. We are literally avoiding sending tens of thousands of people to the hospital and emergency rooms every year, avoiding thousands of cases of heart attacks, skin cancer, aggravated asthma, and lung damage thanks to the Clean Air Act. Senator Merkley made the point a few moments ago about the view of the American Lung Association on this issue and their strong concerns what, as to what will happen to respiratory illnesses if we weaken the Clean Air Act. We are currently reducing toxic pollution like mercury that the CDC has said causes major developmental problems for children. Our nation's leading public health experts, including the American Academy of Pediatrics, the American College of Preventative Medicine, the American Public Health Association, the Asthma and Allergy Foundation of America, the American Heart Association, and the American Lung Association recently said the Clean Air Act's continued implementation is, and I quote, quite literally a matter of life and death for tens of thousands of people and will mean the difference between chronic debilitating illness or a healthy life for hundreds of thousands more, end of quote. That is what is at stake. I will vote against the Inhofe Amendment and urge my colleagues to vigorously oppose this attack on our public health. While this amendment may benefit wealthy oil companies, it is an attack on the health of all Americans who want to breathe healthy air and drink clean water. Uh, and with that, I would... Mr. Senator President. from Louisiana.
Thank you, Mr. President. I see there are two members on the floor, and I just, for order, would like to ask if Senator Johans could go next for five or ten minutes, unanimous consent, and then Senator Rockefeller, who wanted to speak, and then we're going to try to get to some sort of consent for one or two votes tonight. We're still hoping to do that around six o'clock, and we'll try to keep people posted. Mr. President. The Senator from Nebraska. Mr. President, I rise uh, this afternoon to support the pending Joe Hance uh, Mansion Amendment 161, which I believe would send a very positive, strong message to job creators that Congress is listening, that we have heard them. The bill we are debating today to help small businesses utilize federal funding for research and development is certainly important. But I have to tell you, I believe what our small businesses are focused on, what they are really worried about, is the avalanche of new regulations that is headed their way. They're worried about the mountain of paperwork that's about to overwhelm them due to the 1099 reporting requirements contained in Section 9006 of the health care law. You see, instead of focusing on hiring new workers and growing their businesses, they are meeting with accountants. They're wondering why those in Washington choose to weigh them down further after the last two years. So the amendment I offer today seeks to solve that problem by repealing the 1099 reporting mandate that is weighing down upon them. As we all know, I'm referring to the tax paperwork nightmare that, as I said, is buried in Section 9006 of the health care law. It's straightforward. It says if a business purchases more than $600 of goods or services from another business, then they're required to generate and provide to that business and to the Internal Revenue Service a 1099 form. This new mandate will affect 40 million businesses in this nation. That's not even mentioning the nonprofits, the churches, our local and state governments that are also impacted. Furthermore, it will stand in the way of job creators by forcing businesses to waste capital and human resources on really useless paperwork. Considering the high unemployment rates plaguing many states, it doesn't make sense that we'd keep this job suppressing paperwork mandate. Yet repealing this nonsensical mandate has been a long and somewhat tortured path. I first circulated a dear colleague letter asking for co-sponsors on the 1099 repeal back in June of last year. And when we introduced it in July, we had 25 co-sponsors and small businesses watched us with great anticipation. It gave them hope that common sense was going to prevail here in the Senate and that partisanship could be set aside to just simply do the right thing. But unfortunately, that hope did evaporate. They've been frustrated time and time again when it failed to advance in September and in November and appeared stalled as we came into the new year. But finally, they saw a ray of hope on March 3rd when the House passed 1099 repeal. Mr. President, it was a very large bipartisan uh, effort, 314 to 112. And small businesses cheered last week when the majority leader Reid endorsed the House passed version and indicated H.R. 4 would likely be passed directly to the, and go on directly to the President by the end of the week. Yet, when Thursday rolled around, a vote on 1099 repeal was shelved and replaced with a vote on a judicial nominee. And once again, our job creators were left scratching their heads, disappointed by the continued political gamesmanship on this very important issue. Moving the post yet again, we now hear that some are objecting to, ho to the House bill's offset to completely pay for the repeal of the 1099 mandate. This now supposedly controversial provision simply reduces improper payments over payments of insurance subsidies. 
As the Secretary of Health and Human Services said, the repayment of improper subsidies makes it, quote, fair for recipients and taxpayers, unquote. Yet some have now decided that this House offset is somehow a middle class tax increase. And that argument just to me is stunning, Mr. President. Since when is requiring someone to repay what was given to them erroneously ever regarded as a tax increase? Where I come from, that's just simply smart government for the taxpayer. Furthermore, I find it a bit too convenient that not one senator complained about using this very offset to pay for the Medicare doc fix last December. Remember, the Senate passed the doc, fi doc fix, and they did unanimously. Only two people opposed it in the House, and the President signed it eagerly. Yet today, some have decided it's somehow a tax increase. It doesn't pass the smell test, Mr. President, and our small businesses, well, they're not buying it either. They'll see it as just one more hollow excuse why we can't provide businesses and their workers relief from the nonsensical paperwork mandate. These job creators have watched dueling amendments and proposals and counterproposals for too long, and they've grown impatient. Our small businesses really do deserve better, but unfortunately, right at the moment, we're getting more of the same. And more legislation, legislative squabbling only delays the certainty that our business community wants us to provide to them. They are looking for us to help them through this paperwork mess. Well, what's happening out there is because this is now starting to stare them in the face, they're already starting to think about software because they've got to track this, and there's a cost to that. They're talking to their accountants, and that costs money. They're diverting very precious capital in anticipation of the new mandate. Not to mention the fact that rental property owners are currently subject to the new mandate, and unfortunately, our rental property owners are having to comply with it and track each payment for repairs and for upkeep. We need to give these folks a break so they can focus on growing and creating jobs, not worrying how to pay for additional accountants. Passing H.R. 4 would show them that we are listening to their concerns and we're committed to removing the unnecessary, or unnecessary barriers to their success. Well, instead, we're requiring our job creators to wait on the sidelines while this just continues to go on and on and on, and they deserve better. So I join our nation's job creators once again, asking the Senate to act on this very important issue and repeal the 1099 requirement. Rest assured, Mr. President, they won't go away, and we don't want them to. We want them to do everything they can to create jobs. I will offer this legislation as an amendment to every legislative vehicle moving in the Senate till it becomes law. I am hopeful not many more of these amendments will be needed because there's a simple solution. Just repeal it. I believe there's strong bipartisan support for it. We can then send it to the president. He can sign it as he said he would, and we can celebrate this in a very bipartisan way. A vote on this amendment is significant, not only because it really truly is the right thing to do, but because it will show that H.R. 4 has more than 60 votes needed to pass the Senate. All we need to do is try on this and get it done. Once again, I point out, Mr. President, that this is a bipartisan effort. This is an effort that Republicans and Democrats and independents can claim victory and say, we got this done, it was the right thing to do, it never should have been in the health care bill in the first place. My hope is that my colleagues will stick with me on this. We can get it done, we can get it passed, and get it signed by the President. 
You will hear a cheer all over this country by, by our job creators when it, is, when it is finally repealed. With that, Mr. President, thank you. I yield the floor. Mr. President. The Senator from West Virginia. Mr. President, um, I have comments that I want to make on 1099, which are at variance with the distinguished senator from Nebraska. But I don't, I'll, I'll hold that for another moment. Um, I think it's well known uh, that in West Virginia we've had our problems with EPA, and I have an amendment which would uh, say for a period of two years that they would not have the power to enforce uh, their laws on stationary sources, i.e. power plants. But it's, it lasts for two years and then it stops. What is my reason for doing that? I will offer this amendment. My reason for doing that is that I want to give us the time to come up with a good uh, carbon sequestration uh, bill and also give us the time to come up with an energy policy. Since after, if my amendment were to pass, since it's two years from the date of passage, that does give us the time if, if it is the will of the Congress to have an energy policy. If it is not, then that, of course, is quite a different matter. But I, um, I simply cannot support and will not support uh, the McConnell Amendment, which calls for a complete emasculation of EPA uh, forever. I don't understand this type of thinking. I understand that we're in a, in a very sort of a difficult position in a post-election period where people um, have very, very strong ideas. Let's get rid of government and let's size everything down and get rid of um, all of these people who have been giving us trouble. I think we have to be mature in the way we approach these problems, and I don't think by saying that EPA, created by President Nixon in 1972, shall virtually cease to exist with respect to any effect on greenhouse gases at all, forever. The concept of doing something forever is to me a very risky thing, uh, just on its face. Uh, it, it doesn't usually make any sense, whether it's health care or energy policy or any other kind of policy, to make a law which has to do with regulation uh, and then say it, it, you can't regulate forever. I mean, what if you did that to the Consumer Product Safety Commission? Uh, we've discovered that, um, uh, that children, the little models they use for crash tests, are not, in fact, big enough. The little children aren't big enough. They were created a number of years ago, and kids are much bigger now. And so we have to change, and that's the Commerce Committee is working on this, we have to change the size of the little dummies they put in these seats to crash test them to see what happens to them, because kids are larger. And so if you'd made a rule that this was to last forever the, uh, under the original circumstance, Obviously, that would hurt our children and, and create uh, uh, discomfort and, and sadness. The Environmental Protection Agency is not friv a frivolous agency. It is created to, yes, to regulate um, uh, carbon dioxide emissions. And uh, I have been saying to the West Virginia Coal Association, which for the most part, doesn't believe in climate science. They don't believe there's a climate problem. And I have been saying to them for a number of years that that's wrong, in my judgment. There is a, the science is true. The science is unequivocally true. And that, that there is a price to carbon in their future. I said this a couple of months ago. Uh, there's a price to carbon in their future. You can't simply carry on business the way you're doing it now and avoiding any uh, sense of responsibility and, and be called a mature corporation or a mature person uh, in this country or, or a mature uh, public servant. I, uh, I understand the fervor of uh, the senator from Oklahoma, the senator from Kentucky, and others who uh, put up this amendment for a permanent ban on any regulation of, uh, of carbon uh, dioxide uh, or any other of these areas. But in the process, of course, 
What they say, therefore, is that the EPA can no longer regulate CAFE standards. And that is, um, you know, how many miles per hour. If you look at the private sector, there is a, a drive and a kind of competition now to increase and raise the level of corporate uh, fuel standards, average fuel standards, emissions. And uh, that's as it should be. That's a natural product of free enterprise competition. But to say that EPA, if there, well, what were there to be a backslide? And what if the big three and a number of others decided, well, this isn't worth our while, plus, you know, there's nobody regulating us, so we don't have to do anything about it. And so they would slip backwards and then create a much more uh, emission-charged climate. I can't abide by that. I can't believe that that's sensible government. I can't believe that uh, in the theological drive to make government small, to make government disappear, to make health care disappear, uh, to make all kinds of things disappear um, so that we can all be happy again as we were in the 1910s and 50s, I guess. Uh, li life doesn't work like that, Mr. President, and legislation should not work like that. We should approach it thoughtfully um, with a long view as well as a short view. The short view says, oh, I have to be mad at EPA, and I am, because they've done things in West Virginia which I think are wrong and um, should be changed. But I would never for a moment consider saying that they should forever be banned from having anything to do with uh, you know, climate change policies or cafe standards. It just doesn't make any sense. It's embarrassing. It's embarrassing. That's not a favor to the people of West Virginia. That, what that means is that, that the um, companies, coal companies and power companies uh, that, are look, uh, that are looking at all of this, uh, they'll just start walking away from coal very quickly. This will be also true. Natural gas is beginning to take over large parts of our electric power industry. Uh, that's happened in North Carolina and Ohio, probably a little bit in, in Pennsylvania, yes, a little bit in West Virginia. The Marcellus Shale uh, is just an unbounded, endless pool of natural gas, and, and it, it lies up and down the Appalachian spine. And uh, companies are beginning to switch away from coal to natural gas. Now, you can either, if you don't care about coal miners and you don't care about coal companies, but particularly coal miners, they're not, you know, they're not responsible for any of this. They just dig the coal that God put in the earth a billion years ago. They dig it, and then it's shipped by trail, by a truck or by rail, or in some fashion by barge, uh, off to a power company. The power companies are the ones that have to make the decision. How are they going to burn it? Are they going to burn it cleaner? Well, uh, two power companies, uh, two companies, in West Virginia, American Electric Power has conducted an experiment in New Haven, which is one of our largest, which actually is the largest plant, I believe, power plant in the country. And they have picked out 18% of all their emissions. And they have applied carbon capture and sequestration to that 18%. And that 18% of the flue glass emissions have gone from whatever carbon content down to about 10% carbon content. That's called clean coal. When we talk about coal on this floor, everybody assumes that coal is always dirty. Well, coal is dirty when it's taken out of the ground and nothing happens to it. But with all the science and technology that we have available, carbon capture and sequestration is not only working to make that clean coal, therefore highly competitive, much more competitive than natural gas, which is 50% carbon uh, monoxide. Uh, it makes it only 10% when you use these technologies. That's what my amendment, the two-year amendment, and then only two years, that's what it's meant to give us the time to do. And sensibly, that's what we ought to be doing if people cared about having an energy policy. 
The, um, then there's another plant, Dow Chemical. Dow Chemical is not usually associated with these things, but they're, they're running exactly the same kind of a uh, burning of coal uh, focus and demonstration using a slightly different technology, but also getting about 90% of the carbon out of the coal, which they use, the, the power from that. They use that. So don't tell me it can't be done. Just tell me that we don't have the technology to do it broadly enough. But if you're talking about a nation with a couple of hundred years of coal left, uh, don't, I don't want to hear about dirty coal because that's not going to get anywhere. About clean coal, that can do a lot better than natural gas and do a lot better than a lot of other um, alternative energies. What's going on in Japan right now, uh, I, I shy away from the idea of saying, oh, well, then we've got to stop ever building any nuclear power plant forever. I'm not a big fan of nuclear power, but I don't think you make decisions like that. You don't make them out of emotion. You don't make them because there's a catastrophe in another country. Maybe there is, maybe there isn't. I haven't checked the news in four or five hours. But that's 20% of all of our power in this country. So before we make that decision, let's be thoughtful about it. I think we ought to be thoughtful about this amendment saying for uh, the McConnell Amendment, saying forever and forever that the EPA will be completely stripped away in terms of any power for, for, um, uh, for carbon monoxide, climate uh, problems, and in, in to boot, and pl plus anything else that creates uh, carbon, you know, it could be factories, any, all kinds of things. They will be completely free of any kind of regulation. And I think that's wrong. I think the regulation has to be put in place, which is reasonable, which would be the purpose of my amendment for two years, and then that would be it. Um, and then we'd see where we are then. But to do a permanent, complete emasculation of, this, uh, of the EPA isn't what a mature body of legislators does, in my judgment. I therefore will vote against this amendment and um, will wait to see the result than do my amendment, which I think is much more uh, sensible. I thank the chair and yield the floor. Mr. President, uh, thank you so Louisiana. much. Senator Louisiana. Mr. President, I, I thank um, Senator Rockefeller and all the members that have come to the floor today to debate this important bill and to share their thoughts about other amendments that are uh, some directly but some indirectly related to our discussion. Uh, it doesn't look like we are going to vote tonight, um, but we're going to continue to work throughout the evening as members want to come to the floor and speak on their amendments, and we're going to try to work something out for tomorrow. But I want to thank Senator Snow and her staff for their good work today. I see that um, Senator Whitehouse is on the floor, and he may want to speak about an amendment, but I'd like to just um, remind uh, everyone that we are on the SBIR and STTR Reauthorization Act. Uh, it's a very important um, piece of legislation that has been sputtering for a reauthorization now for over six years, and there are literally thousands of entities, small businesses, dozens of federal agencies, many, many organizations from the Chamber of Commerce to the American Small Business Association that are depending on us to do our work and actually get this program reauthorized. Um, it is important to give consistency and permanency, and so we're going to continue to work to do that, and I look forward to speaking in more detail about the bill later tonight and tomorrow, but it looks like we're not going to have uh, votes uh, tonight, but hopefully we can get uh, some order and some agreement to proceed. At this time, I see the Senator, um, uh, Senator Whitehouse on the floor. Mr. President. Senator from Rhode Island. Mr. President, uh, we are not at this uh, moment without votes on this important legislation for lack of effort by the distinguished senator from Louisiana. She has been extraordinarily determined uh, on this, as she was with her earlier small business legislation, which she fought through to a success, and I'm sure this will be fought through to a success as well. But one of the ways in which uh, our friends on the other side are seeking to harass and impede this important 
piece of legislation is by putting on unrelated amendments, uh, particularly really poisonous unrelated amendments, uh, including the one that Senator Rockefeller just spoke about to completely gut and strip the authority that the United States Supreme Court has recognized uh, EPA has to protect us from the hazard of carbon pollution. Underlying this procedural maneuver, um, which really would interfere with this significant jobs-related bill, is a fundamental disagreement about whether or not our atmosphere is really being affected by the carbon pollution that we have been pumping into it. And I would submit that the facts are entirely on one side of that debate and the polluters are entirely on the other. And it is really only in a building like this in which uh, so many special interests have such sway that that debate has the currency that it appears to have achieved here. Much of what is happening is really non-debatable. Scientists know, not from theory, but from observation, from calculation, what the range of parts per million of carbon dioxide has been in the atmosphere for 8,000 centuries. You can go back and you can find the carbon record in ice and in other ways, and you can establish what the range was of carbon dioxide in our atmosphere. And for the last 800,000 years, it's been between 170 and about 300 parts per million. That's the bandwidth, 170 to 300 parts per million over 800,000 years. For the first time in 800,000 years, we are out of that range. The present concentration, again, a measurement, not a theory, exceeds 391 parts per million. And scientists can do something like draw a trajectory, which is something that people do all over this world. It is not complicated. It is not theory. If you draw a trajectory based on where we are going, uh, the trajectory puts us at 688 parts per million in the year 2095 and 1,097 parts per million in the year 2195. These are levels that not only haven't been seen in 800,000 years, they haven't been seen in millions of years. This is an experiment in the very nature, the very physics of our planet. And it's been known since the, really just after the Civil War when the Irish scientist Tyndall discovered that CO2 in the atmosphere had a warming effect, had a blanketing effect, and warmed the atmosphere. That has been bomb-proof science for more than a century. It's in basic textbooks. And when you take that scientific theory, basic, established, more than 100 and what is it now, 30, 40 years old, and then you combine it with the facts as we see it, that it's been in this range of 170 to 300, it's now out of an 8,000 century range and climbing, and you look at some of the effects that are beginning to happen that are also consistent with that, a fairly undeniable story begins to add up. And the day will come, I am confident, when our grandchildren look back at this moment, at our unwillingness to deal with the plain scientific evidence in front of us, and instead to be persuaded by merchants of doubt with big checkbooks who have a vested interest in the outcome of this, who have a conflict of interest, and we're listening to them, and we're not listening to the plain facts and to the plain scientists, science and to theories that have been known for more than a century, people will look back at us with real shame. There's no other word for it. Shame and disgust that this was the way we address this problem in our planet. Um, you know, we look back at other events like this. Galileo had a view based on his observations on science as to how the planets worked. And he was intimidated out of it by the power of the day, which couldn't abide that. And he was taken before the Inquisition and he was forced to recant. The legend is that when he recanted, he quietly said to himself, I recant, but the planets stay their courses. Well, 
The planets stay their courses, the laws of physics and chemistry don't change, and we are on a slope towards a very severe problem that we just simply can't put, like the ostrich, our heads in the sand about over and over again. It is just wrong. And so this bill is wrong, the, the amendment is wrong that would strip EPA of it. It will hurt people who depend on this. It has always been good for America when we've made our airs and water cleaner. And we simply cannot uh, go on this way. It is bad for this bill because it puts a poisonous amendment on it when this should be a bill we should all be getting behind. And it is certainly wrong from a point of view of history and science and the obligation that we have to uh, our younger people and to their children who will have to live in a world uh, that faces the consequences of our negligence this day. I thank the uh, presiding officer and I yield the floor. Madam President. The senator from Louisiana. Thank you, Madam President. Um, this has been a very actually invigorating uh, debate uh, on the uh, bill that is pending before the Senate. As I said, there have been a few amendments that have been filed that are directly related to the reauthorization of this important program, and there are others that have uh, arguably indirect uh, impact on small business jobs and uh, the the uh, creation of um, uh, research and technology for or the opportunity for research and technology uh, investments for small business uh, in America. But we're unable to vote tonight and to come to any consensus about the order of votes. Hopefully we can uh, do that uh, sometime uh, later this evening. But let me take this moment just again to thank the 84 members of the Senate that voted yesterday to give us an opportunity to get to this important bill. And as people have watched this debate uh, throughout the day and continue to watch this evening, uh, one of the reasons that the leadership likes to sometimes put limits, um, appropriate limits on the debate, is to keep people focused on the underlying issue. Uh, but Senator Snow and I decided to urge our leaders to have um, a really open debate because we understand that there are members that feel very, very strongly. Um, about the EPA issues and the climate change rules and regulations, about the 1099 um, provisions. Senator Nelson feels strongly about um, reducing legislative spending. Senator Hutchinson and I have, uh, particularly Sen Senator Hutchinson and I, have strong feelings about the Lease Act. So we're going to be as um, as inclusive and in, and um, incorporate as many of these ideas as we can. But I really want to ask, since we've looked at the amendment list uh, just uh, within the hour, we have 48 amendments pending on this bill. And so I really want to ask, and some people have half a dozen, so I'm going to ask the members and their staffs to please look and see what is absolutely essential for you to offer um, as an amendment on this bill so that we don't miss the opportunity. And that's really what I want to express right now is this will be a missed opportunity to reauthorize one of the best programs uh, at the federal level. We've heard a lot of talk about programs that don't work, about programs that are wasteful, programs that are full of fraud and abuse. This is not one of them. This is the federal government's largest investment program and research and development that gives small businesses in America that we all represent on main streets everywhere, whether it's North Carolina or in Louisiana or California or Massachusetts, small businesses with some of the cutting edge technology, new, you know, exciting science, with very bright people who have graduated from some of the finest universities in the world, giving them an opportunity to put their technology, their know-how, in front of federal agencies for the sole purpose of saving taxpayers money, creating jobs, and increasing the revenues paid to, to governments um, at the local level, state, and federal level to solve our deficit problem. We're not going to solve our debt and deficit problem by cutting, slashing, recklessly, domestic discretionary spending alone. No one in America believes that. It's really, um, I don't know why people come to the floor to continue to promote that idea. It's not going to happen. We're going to get to a balanced budget when we bring our revenues and our spending in appropriate order in line. And when, Madam President, we pass bills like this that literally 
help create thousands and thousands of jobs in America. That's what's going to end the recession. That's what's going to close this budget gap. And that's why I'm going to stay on the floor all week with Senator Snow, who has been wonderfully helpful uh, today and will continue until we can get this bill passed. I don't want us to miss this opportunity because it's been three Congresses, not one, not two, but three Congresses that have tried and failed. We're not going to fail this week. We're not going to, uh, to not pass this bill this week in the Senate. We are going to get a bill out of here over to the House. It's very likely the House will take up our bill as it's generally written. Why do I say that? Because we've already incorporated so many of the House views and thoughts over the last several years. This is not new language to them. We have a new chairman, Chairman Graves. He understands perfectly that we are working hard in the Senate to get this bill uh, over to him and to his good committee. But we have literally, Madam President, thousands of businesses <laughs> you know, kind of on hold because they don't know whether this program is going to be here from week to week. We have agencies that don't know if they should put out solicitations for new technologies. Why would we not want to take this opportunity when we clearly know that this is one of the most effective programs? As I said, let me give you a specific example. We've used it, but it's worth using again, and we have hundreds. A Qualcomm, a company that is very well known, it uh, developed a uh, the software primarily that allows wireless communication. Twenty years ago, nobody ever heard of Qualcomm, and very few people had cell phones that weighed, you know, less than three pounds each, as I remember. But 25 to 30 people came together with Dr. Jacobs. They sat in his den. He testified before our committee just last week on this, and he said through the SBIR program, their initial idea got a couple of hundred thousand dollars. And then phase two, they got a million and a half dollars, which is what this program does, incentivizing or giving grants or contracts to very, to emerging technologies, well before a bank would take a look, well before venture capital funds would even look their direction. You have to develop the technology to a point um, and then have it launched. This is where there's what he described the valley of death. You know, great ideas, but there's just not a lot of patient capital out there, and particularly in this recessionary period. So he says, we help this program. Without it, it would have been virtually um, very, very difficult, he said, to grow our company. Today, that company employs 17,500 people in about 22 countries in the world including right here in the United States of America, and they pay in taxes, Madam President, in one year, a billion dollars. That's 50% of the cost of this entire program. So one company, Qualcomm, in the 25-year life, has grown so much that it pays enough taxes that supports 50% of the cost of this program annually. And I can give you dozens of examples of other companies that have launched through this program. And let me say this, our federal departments are getting better at this. It was a little touch and go at first. People, the federal agencies weren't quite used to it. Senator Rudman helped to create this program. He was very passionate about it, as were others. So we sort of pushed the federal agencies to do this. They were more comfortable doing research and development with the big companies. They felt more comfortable. They felt they weren't taking as much risk. They, you know, no one likes to fail. And so they thought, well, I have this project. I'm going to give it to IBM. If it doesn't work, nobody can blame me. Well, the problem was that IBM didn't have all the answers. We've come to find out sometimes they had very few parts of their career as a company. And not to be disrespectful to that company, but right down the road there were 10 small businesses, but nobody ever heard of them. Scientists no one ever heard of. And so Senator Rudman understood this, and so he said, we're going to mandate a certain percentage of your research and development money to go. You've got to push it out there to small business. Yes, and some of them fail. But as the folks that testified, if they're not failing, this program isn't working. I want to repeat, if they're not failing, this program isn't working because this program is a front-end, 
high risk, but great returns, great returns for the American taxpayer and great returns for small businesses. And I might say, as I said earlier today, it's the envy of many other countries in the world. The gentleman that has done the most research and look over of this particular program um, testified before our committee that he travels around the world and he's called by other nations that say, how is it that the federal government sets up programs that allow the small businesses to uh, enter into research uh, and development? So Senator Snow and I have taken this on as our first priority for this year and for this Congress. We know that there are many important bills pending before our committee, but we believe this is the right bill to present to the Congress in the right order. You're on the committee, as you, um, uh, as you know, Senator, so you know this very well. But we're trying to think of what we could get out of our committee to the floor, to the President's desk that has the most impact, most immediate impact, creates the most jobs, and this is the program. It extends the authorization for eight years. It updates the award sizes for the program from 100,000 to 150. It updates the uh, phase two awards from 750 to 1 million. It increases investment in small business by leveraging, uh, increasing the percentage from 2.5 to 3.5 percent of the research and development monies at all agencies over 10 years, including uh, NIH, Department of Defense. These are very significant numbers for the Department of Defense. It's a billion dollars. A billion dollars, this bill will sort of set aside and say, Defense Department, you're looking for that new radiator for your tank, you're looking at ways to cool, you're looking at ways to you know, sort your ammo more efficiently, you're looking at ways to come up with new software to help that warfighter. Here is a billion dollars of research money, and we want you to ask not just the big companies in America, and around the world, but the small companies, the innovators out there, give them a chance to show you what they have. That's what this program does, and we have reams and reams of data supporting its effectiveness. It also includes uh, this compromise uh, between the biotech, the venture capital industry, and the small business community. They, we had a big fight over the last several years. We've come to a compromise. Neither side is uh, ecstatic, which is a good compromise. They're all sort of just understanding that without this compromise, this bill uh, could um, uh, fall apart, and they know how important it is. So they've come to terms on the basic portion that can be uh, invested by venture capital uh, funds, leaving the integrity of this program as a small business program, which is the way it was created, but allowing an appropriate an appropriate level of involvement with the venture capital industry. Uh, it also creates a federal, state, and technical partnerships. Um, uh, it improves the SBA's ability to oversee and coordinate this program. It adds some metri metrics and measurements so we can really get some good data about how it's working and where it's not working. Uh, and as we authorize it for eight years, we'll be able to really say, Madam President, that we you know, got down to business and we got serious about reauthorizing this important program while leaving this debate uh, open and flexible and allowing the members to have an opportunity to speak about things that they feel strongly about. But I'm hoping that sometime tomorrow we can vote uh, on some of the amendments we discussed today, the McConnell Amendment, uh, the Johans Amendment, uh, potentially, uh, the uh, Vitter Amendment, uh, the Nelson Amendment, uh, Senator Cornyn, Senator Hutchinson, and others were down here uh, to speak. We hope to get their amendments uh, in the queue. But again, if the members would just be cooperative, let Senator Snow and I know uh, if you could choose one or two and not offer six or seven amendments, uh, that would be extremely helpful to us. And just let us know, and our staff's going to work as hard as we can to have the votes that are necessary to move this bill off the floor, get it to the president's desk, because my answer is, for those that say, why aren't we talking about the budget and debt, we are talking about the budget and debt. This is part of closing the budget gap. This is about creating jobs that generate revenue, that close that gap. It's not just about 
discretionary domestic spending cuts. We will never get where we need to be going down that road. We're going to get to it by a combination of things, and that is why Senator Snow and I feel very strongly about bringing this bill to the floor to talk about growing and encouraging job creation, particularly by small businesses, innovators and entrepreneurs, inventors, risk takers that need and rely on this program to launch some new exciting businesses that benefit us all. And whether it's in the state of Oregon or the state of Louisiana, or as I said, or Massachusetts, New York, or California, we have literally thousands of companies that have used this program successfully to grow. Our people are employed and America is continuing to lead in many areas. Unfortunately, we don't lead in every, but in many areas in new emerging technologies, um, depending on the field, of course. But we are very proud of this uh, federal program. So it's an example of a program that works. And if we could work as well as this program does to do our work this week and get this bill actually off the floor intact with some amendments, of course, that will be voted on and get it over to the House, let them do their work and get this bill to the President's desk. We will have done some good work this week. So, um, Mr. President, I'm going to suggest the absence of quorum. I don't see anyone else on the floor. There may be members that want to come and talk about amendments. There will be nothing that will be pending uh, for the next uh, few hours, and hopefully we can get an agreement later on tonight. I suggest the absence of a quorum.